second part of uh, lecture 11. So we were talking about uh, who is the guy who made, who, who are the people who made uh, this uh, Spaceship 2 and White Knight 2. Um, I, ha I had to go and check that and I think the answer is there in the um, slide after this but I just wanted to see that. Uh, it's made by Scale Composites and the guy who made it is, his name is Bert Rutan. Uh, B U R T R U T A N. So I would like you to just go and check out their website, just for this. I mean, just for curiosity's sake. So it shows you what is possible with uh, the composites technology. Okay. So the the idea is that you could not have made this using a traditional autoclave. And they made it using the American Composites Group uh, autoclave material. I mean, out of autoclave prepreg materials. Uh, Lockheed also has been using that for making advanced composite cargo aircraft, uh, and they use the medium temperature uh, out of autoclave processing material because it is 50 feet composite fuselage sections, um, and it is completely replacing metallic structures. So what are the key process parameters and key characteristics for making these? So you need to make them and you need to make sure that you bag them, vacuum bag them properly and there is no leakage and things like that. So, uh, and then you need to do what is called the debulking so that any excess uh, resin is completely removed and it doesn't uh, go and uh, burn and get stuck in different places and things like that. So you need to know what is a resin viscosity profile through the cure and you need to know the degree of impregnation and what is the reinforcement architecture that you need in order to get the best properties. So when you make this you need to make sure that it is completely solid and no porosities are in the cross section. I mean you can observe, you should not be observing any any porosity in the cross section. So they test it using standard uh, panels and see if it can be done using the uh, these prepreg materials and cure it out of autoclave. So for example if it is made by glass fabric so you need to uh, you need to make a flat panel and see what are the properties that you get before you actually make the actual component. So in this case if it is carbon fiber um, you insert a glass toe around in at each corner and and you also insert a thermocouple so you can see that you can observe the cure cycle during the process. And in this case, you also need to use a non-perforated uh, release film over the layup. And then you tape and seal by flash breaker tape at laminate edge and so that you avoid the bridging. So uh, this is pretty self-explanatory. What is the process that is used for that? And so here what you need to do is you need to um, drape it over the prepreg and the uh, dams so that in case any excess resin flows over it will go in and uh, it won't break the uh, break the uh, the vacuum. So this is the standard process. I don't know how much of you, how much you have seen the actual uh, um, vacuum bagging process itself. So this will be a representation of that. And then the whole part is placed inside an oven with a digital temperature recording device. So you know you can see the 
temperature changes as a function of the curing profile and you need to maintain uh, above uh, vacuum I mean it should be better than a traditional vacuum so it should be and it should be maintained throughout the cure so this would be a typical uh, vacuum profile and this would be for a uh, so these are for two different uh, uh, so if it were autoclave this is the profile that you use uh, if it were uh, uh, out of autoclave cure cycle then you have a whole temperature in the middle before it goes to the 180 degree centigrade or 350F cure. So because you need additional venting time to produce a void free laminate. So if you are making large parts there are some uh, differences between the processing parameters for that and small test panels. Okay, so if you have larger dimensions then the edge breathing takes uh, longer and if it is non-flat parts uh, for non-flat parts Each ply is individually laid onto the tool and pre-plied stacks are not used. And parts of curvature require vacuum debulks every few plies to achieve consolidation. Otherwise, it's, it's going to leave behind porosities. And the mold tools will often be a composite and um, maybe even made using out of autoclave uh, uh, prepared type of materials. And the FEP release film may not always drape over the curved surfaces, so you need a liquid release agent um, so that you can easily remove the part after the curing is done. So there are certain differences. Um, I'm not expecting you to understand all of it, but just understand that there are differences between a straight panel and a, a complex shape that you make using this out of water clip type of pre -break. So you need to have very, very good vacuum. Okay, so the higher the temperature, um, you need to have better uh, vacuum gauge reading. So at lower temperatures, you need to have very, very good vacuum so that all the porosity can be completely removed. So here again is, a, is a, another uh, explanation of the processing conditions. So you can see that higher the vacuum reading, lower the void content. So if you are going to use low temperature pre preg you may get higher void content and if you are using MTM451 um, so there are certain conditions so you can see that higher vacuum gauge reading will give you almost close to 0% porosity. So these are the, so this would be the cure starting point. So you can see that in this case, uh, MTM 45. So you can see that its cure starts at around 180 degrees centigrade or 350F. Um, so that's one of the reasons why you are getting very, very low porosities. And where you make it is also your barometric pressure is also going to affect your quality. So if you are going to 
do it in El Segundo or uh, Fax River, you need to have higher barometric pressure in order to get the best properties. Ideal would be 28, but if you are in El Segundo or Philadelphia, you need to have higher porosity. But if you are doing it in St. Louis or Dallas, you may, you may be able to get away with 25. And if you are in Tulsa, you need to go to say 29 or so if you are using out of autoclave prepreg. So I'm sorry, this is a, a huge listing, but what you can say is that the minimum required vacuum level is 28 and the best would be 30. And if you want to reduce that, you can reduce it for lower barometric pressure levels, uh, but, but most of the time you need at least 28. You also need to have, if, if you don't have a uh, dry fiber path uh, for permitting the air and volatile extraction, then your degree of impregnation will be less than 100%. So you do not want it to be, want it to have this kind of porosity. So what is debulking? It is a it's a step in the process where you need to do what you need to do in order to consolidate part layers during the manufacture. And it's typically done at room temperature. <coughs> you need to have a bagging in order for debulking and it usually replaces the non-perforated separator film and it can have three three effects so you know there is no effect it could have beneficial effects and it could have detrimental effects but the main benefit is that it can extract some of the entrapped air prior to an out of autoclave cure but it can also cause premature flow and block off escape paths so that might tend to be detrimental to laminate quality. So the best practice depends on the specific resin, reinforcement and impregnation level. And in this case, the, it's, it's beneficial for the medium temperature uh, cure type of approaches. They did a design of experiments and what they found is that um, it had some benefits. I'm sorry, I mean, this is a very busy uh, slide. Uh, I'm taking it from uh, Chris uh, Ridgard at, uh, uh, who used to be at ACG, but now he works for Solvay. So his name is Chris Ridgard. So he is the one who gave me these slides. Um, so he had a lot of information to talk about all this process. So I apologize. So if you want to know more about it, you can go in and uh, look at that or you can look up the papers, okay? Look up some papers. So they did that and what they found is that uh, if you did debulking, so what is debulking? Debulking means you extract the air and then you just bulk it. I mean, so apply pressure um, and then when you do that, the pre the, the thickness of the pre layers actually reduces. But if you don't extract the air and the excess resin inside that, so you are going to end up having porosity inside. So which is not a good thing. So you want to, it to be as close to the final shape as possible. So one variation would be to make out of water clay uh, processed honeycomb sandwich structures. So again, this describes a process. So there you need to use some kind of new film adhesive that is compatible with the pre material itself. 
So in this case, uh, what could happen is that during the process, the adhesive can actually foam. And if it is not vented, it can leave behind porosity inside the, inside the honeycombs. But if you vent it uh, in the open uh, process, then you know that, that porosity can actually be removed almost completely. So this shows the pictures of the, the close-up pictures of that uh, process. So in this case, if you are not careful, it, the adhesive can foam uh, and it is not a good thing. It can leave behind uh, porosity in the structure and create um, a reduction in the properties. So this is a Nomex uh, core. So you can see that the there is no porosity in the in between the um, in between the honeycomb uh, areas, which is what we want to do, which we which is what we want in the part. So, what are some of the advan I mean, uh, some of the issues with adhesive foaming? So, if you are If you have foaming, then it won't be bonded properly between the face sheet and the honeycomb itself. So you want to avoid that at, um, at, if at all possible. So they, uh, these are some test results of the different adhesives. Um, and you can see that uh, The adhesive at uh, uh, room temperature had a uh, single lab shear strength that was uh, pretty high compared to the uh, 180 and uh, 150 degree centigrade type of material. Again, um, these are some properties determined by NASA um, and you can see that um, they measured some, I'm, I'm sorry, this is, the numbers are pretty small. You could probably go in and uh, look at it in order to get the properties. So I, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go over in great detail. So let me skip, skip some of these. So what you can see is that if you have, um, So this would this would show some void on the um, uh, out of auto, autoclave versus out of autoclave. So this would be for the control demo panel, and you can actually reduce it to less than two percent if you carefully control the uh, processing conditions. So if you want uh, good uh, venting, you can place this kind of a uh, breather scrim materials in certain areas so that you can um, use that to extract the, uh, the void content or reduce the void content. Again, these are some pictures of that. So let me go over. Uh, uh, so what it shows is that these are the densities of common aerospace resin systems. Uh, so some of these out of autoclave materials have much lower density compared to the traditional uh, epoxy materials. Like for example, 977-2, it has a density of 1.31, whereas MTM44-1, which is the medium temperature uh, 
curing out of autoclave prepreg, it has a it has a density of 1.18. So it is about uh, about 10-15% lower than the 977-2 epoxy prepreg. So here again shows the demonstration part. So one big advantage with the auto autoclave processing is that it can be used for automated manufacturing. So if you are going to be putting it through a set of rollers and things like that, you can actually use it for automated manufacturing. So you can cut it and place it and things like that during the processing conditions itself. So it is very amenable to 3D printing. So this material can also be used for making tooling and novel material configurations. So tooling can also be made using uh, these materials. So tooling doesn't need to have um, very good integrity, but it just needs to keep the shape during the actual processing itself. So what is the big advantage? So when you are heating and cooling, its heating and cooling rates are going to be the same as the composite material itself. So that is a big advantage because now you don't have to heat up the whole material uh, at a faster rate or a slower rate compared to the actual part itself. So if you are making a big uh, um, big uh, part, so for example, this is the uh, catamaran you made for the America's Cup. So they use that using, I mean, they, so made it, they made the tooling using these out of autoclave materials. So here is a busy table with all the information. So the composite tooling is made using uh, these prepreg type of material, out of autoclave prepreg type of materials. You can also add some kind of uh, syntactic uh, fillers in the material to reduce the weight even further. So in this case the tooling was made in two days. Just imagine, I mean, if you have a metal tooling or even a wood tooling like this, just imagine the time it will take to shape and cut and join and things like that. It will take, it will definitely not going to be two days. So one big advantage is that if you use an auto water clip cure tool, you can use a home manufactured low cost oven. So, I mean, if you use space heaters and things like which is what we did, did in the case of the integrated um, infinite composites uh, technologies for making big pressure tanks, uh, low composite, I mean, low, I mean, all composite pressure vessels. We did that using this out of autoclave type of a tooling. This is pretty, pretty self-explanatory. If you want to make a wind turbine tooling, wind turbine, you need the tooling. So that needs to be made using something like this, something, uh, a material like the auto autoclave type of prepreg. So one big advantage is that these materials have been in existence for pretty long time. So there is a lot of uh, database of information that is available for you to use these materials in your design approaches. So what is the design approach? If you have the basic data, then the basis values are statistically derived for each strength property. 
So the B basis values are used for the majority of design purposes. So what is that? It is 90% of the data. If when you can say that 90% of the data exceed the basis values with a statistical confidence level of 95%. That means you are using B basis values. If you are using A basis values, it is rarely used um, and it is typically used for uh, non-redundant critical structures, which means 99% of the data exceed the basis value with a statistical confidence level of 95%. And that is not often used. So most of the time we use what are called B basis values. So how do you calculate them? It is you take the mean strength times the standard deviation. That is the B basis value. No, I'm sorry. Mean strength minus uh, what is KB? Let me, uh, I, I will find out and uh, I will uh, uh, place this again. Okay, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about this again. Okay, so let me stop here and uh, I will uh, uh, discuss this in the next part of lecture 11.